My full name is Reginald Morton Fountain, Jr. Nickname's Reggie. And tell us when you were born, your birth date. I was born uh, in Tarboro, North Carolina. And uh, my birthday is April 12, 1940. 1940. All right, so tell us a little bit about uh, your parents in Tarboro, your family. I grew up in Tarboro uh, in the 40s and early 50s. Uh, my father was a uh, life insurance salesman, like I later became, and he, uh, he was in a small, little, small real estate business. My mom was a, a housewife, but she was the smartest person in the family, having been valedictorian of all of school classes and all. So they stayed on me continuously to try to do the best they could with me. And, uh, and so we uh, uh, stayed in Tarboro until 1958. Uh, while in high school there, I, I played football and basketball and baseball and uh, went to Tarboro High School for all but two years. And there were two years that my parents sent me to Asheville School for Boys in Asheville, North Carolina. Came back uh, from Asheville and finished my high school career in 1958. Went to the University of North Carolina Business School from 58 to 62. And University of North Carolina uh, Law School from 60, uh, 3, 4, and 5. Now, you also had a very well-known uncle that was a I had congressman a, that lived close to you when you grew yeah, up across I the street. Yeah, I had a, a very well-known uncle, L.H. Fountain who was congressman for 30 years over in the 2nd Congressional District of North Carolina. And he was a very well-respected uh, politician that got a lot done for this state. Yes, sir. He was a well-respected uh, politician that uh, he got an awful lot done, worked all the time, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Well, uh, and you have that same type of drive. You, uh, you have sacrificed a lot. Let's talk a little bit about... Um, um, you were an athlete, you mentioned, uh, you were active, you did well, uh, but uh, you uh, started water skiing uh, early in life in your early teens and barefoot eight years water old skiing. was my first water skiing. Water skiing when you were eight. Eight years old, yeah, up and down this river here. And um, uh, I'd come down here with friends I had, but we'd come down with our boats and we'd water ski here. And uh, I'd boat. Uh, some of our first race boats, I had my first one at 14. We tested them up and down the river here. And, uh, and I did all that for pleasure, uh, actually, uh, through high school, college, uh, law school. And then uh, my first 10 years in the boat business, I was racing on the side as a hobby for the weekends. Got good enough that Mercury Marine called me up and hired me to run with the Mercury racing team all over the world, myself, Earl Bentz, and Billy Seabold. And so that's when I got into uh, to racing full-time professionally with, with Mercury. Mercury uh, and our racing team won all the races we were in, every single one of them, until finally all the competitors of the other manufacturers uh, quit, quit racing, just pulled out in 1978. So when that happened, Mercury said, well, there's no need for us to race anymore. They were all quitting and giving us the award for being the best. So the head of racing at Mercury says, Reggie, we're going to go into boat business. And I said, we are. And he said, yeah. I said, what, what are you, where are you going to build them? He says, well, I thought you'd build them down at your place and we'll design and develop a boat. And we did that in 78, 79, and in 80, we started selling boats. So let's back up just a little bit. You know, you are an innovator and you understand uh, uh, the principles of hydrodynamics. Tell us, for lay people that don't understand the, the mechanical part of that, when you look at water and a boat, what is it somebody needs to understand to, uh, have the, uh, to, to, to make a boat? Well, hydrodynamics uh, had a lot to do with my water skiing. Mm -hmm. um, I skied when I first started on two skis at eight years old, but by 12 years old, I was on one ski and skiing all around as fancy as I could be. And uh, then uh, later, uh, in, in late, before I was 14, I was skiing barefooted. And so you got to understand hydrodynamics and know the pressure you need on your feet to step on top of the water with no skis on. 
I learned all that from a good friend of mine here, Wayne Woolard, who I think is probably the best barefoot water skier in the world. <laughs> Wayne can ski backwards barefooted on one foot. So uh, the f water skiing was my first hydrodynamic experience. And as I got into the boats, uh, hydrodynamics uh, put a lot more drag on a boat and running through the water than aerodynamics put on an airplane or a car running through the air. So what you have to do is to calculate how to lower the hydrodynamic drag and get into aerodynamic drag, which means getting the boat up out of the water, basically flying over top of the water, you have less drag. If you have less drag aerodynamically than you would hydrodynamically, you get rid of the hydrodynamic drag as much as possible, you run faster. So let's go back for just a minute to law school. While you were at law school, you were selling life insurance. Yes, sir. So you liked that and you were very successful at it. Did you ever practice law? Uh, I never practiced law other than uh, uh, I, I passed the bar. Yep. And I originally had a law license, but I never renewed it when it expired and you have to renew it in 1978. So I never practiced law except as, as I needed it for doing uh, the uh, uh, insurance sales that I did for people. I did estate planning for people and helped them figure out an outcome for their life and their family's life in the future, whether it be retirement or working or whatever. And uh, my law degree I mostly used later when I set up found power boats and was running it. It helped a lot to know uh, the law and so what I needed to do to set a corporation up, relieve some liability and that type of thing. Give you a lot of business acumen. Um, when you were 39, 1979, you officially retired from the life insurance business. Yes, sir. And you had a, you were pretty well financially set. You had a pretty good pension each month. You really didn't need to start a boat company. Well, uh, I needed to do something and I could have kept selling <laughs> life insurance, but I decided it's going to be more fun uh, to run the, the boats and to build the boats. And so I put all my effort towards that and took a field just down the road that you came by when you came down here and uh, bought about 95 acres of land and cleared it off where there was tobacco and corn and cotton and that type thing and, and built found power boats. I started with 10,000 feet and then it went to 16,000 feet and it kept on going until finally it reached almost a quarter of a million square feet of manufacturing operation. And in fact, I think in about 2006, you were Beaufort County's largest employer. Uh, these are really good jobs. Yeah, they were. <clears throat> in, 19, in 2006, uh, we had our best year. We did uh, 80 million in sales on uh, just a little over 400 boats. And the total sales uh, before I got out of the company uh, in 2009, uh, we had done just over a billion dollars in sales over the 30 years that I was in business. You know, I, I think a very interesting statistic, uh, and as you mentioned, you've sold $1.1 billion in fountain power boats of yes, different sir. types. 23% of all fountain power boat owners, it's the first boat they've ever purchased, they've ever owned. What do you attribute that to? And the marketing program, <laughs> spending anywhere from three to eight or nine million a year in marketing, and the bigger we got, the more we spent. Uh, and in that marketing program, we would tell them how we built the boats, we would tell them about the races we'd won, the fishing tournaments we'd won, and it was all dependent on the performance of the boat. So as we did that, it built up sales. And, um, and, and it gave people an insight as to why they wanted to buy our boats as opposed to somebody else's boats. And our boats really were faster than the other boats that we were competing against. They handled better. And uh, we had a lot of people that were high rollers, like for example, President Bush owned three of my boats during his lifetime. And uh, his son has, uh, the, the second President Bush, he, he has one of those boats now. Don't you think that part of it also is your great engineering and understanding that someone that's never driven a boat before can get behind the wheel of a fountain and it's easier or easier than driving a car? 
Yeah, you know, uh, that had a lot to do with our marketing. And in our marketing programs, we had videos made like the King of Offshore that we could send to people on how to run and operate boats. And everybody that bought one of my boats could come here to the factory as we delivered it. And uh, I'd give them a personal instruction as to how to run the boat. And so through the personal instruction we gave and the videos we gave them, uh, that taught them how to run what was really the best handling, most responsive power boat that had ever been built to that time. And that helped us sell the boats. And racing helped you sell boats too. I know that uh, when you'd go to the Miami Boat Show and were doing races and things, the line would be out the door at the Fountain Power Boat booth. <laughs> it always, Not at other people's booths. It always was. And, and in the video I gave you, The King of Offshore, which is now on YouTube, uh, you, could, you could see our booth there where we were taking pictures of it and there was thousands of people all around the booth. You couldn't even hardly get into the booth because everybody wanted to see the boats, touch them, feel them, and, and know about them. And a lot of people came in and wanted to buy them. We'd come in with some really high rollers that wanted to buy those boats. And then we sold boats to the U.S. Customs, U.S. Navy, U.S. Coast Guard, some uh, uh, other uh, operations that use them for business, too. Let's talk about, um, you have over, there are over 10,000 fountain power boats that have been manufactured. Uh, and let's talk about some of your customers. You talked about President Bush. Yes, sir. Um, King Hussein. King Hussein of Jordan. Yeah, John, he, John Gotti. John, John Gotti. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was one of them, too. Uh, and in fact, we had, uh, we never did any smuggling ourselves. I, I don't approve of any of that, but we had a lot of smugglers that wanted to go fast and not get caught. It would come by our boats, too. And there were two of them, John Cotty and uh, uh, John Gotti, and, and I guess, he, I don't know what he did. I'm not going to say what he did, but whatever he did got him in trouble. Well, and uh, but it's the who's who of leaders of the world. Yes, sir. Um, celebrities, high rollers. Yes, sir. Um, if they wanted the best performing powerboat that was made, they had a fountain. They had to buy a fountain. And, uh, and that was all because of the product we'd made and the marketing we did to tell people about that, and that helped us. I think the other thing that I wish you got more credit for, you get credit for a lot of things, but the thing that I wish you got more credit for was the impact on Eastern North Carolina, Beaufort County, and Washington. You made the Pamlico Tar River the premier boat racing waterway in the United States. Yes, sir, we did. We're, we're proud of that. You built a huge facility factory here and employed 450 people. That was one of the best parts of my business yeah. is that all the people we hired from around here, we literally paid out millions of dollars to them. I think we had probably the best uh, salaried payroll as far as how much you could make for what you did of anybody that we uh, competed against or any other manufacturer here. High and I like jobs. that. I like and, that. And contributed greatly to the tax base, all the taxes she paid. But all that money goes back into the communities, the schools, the quality of life. The impact that you've had on this region is people don't understand the legacies of Reggie Fountain and Fountain Powerboats and what they've done. I also want to talk about uh, the, po the positive lift hull. Your beak hull came about through uh, an artist from Washington, Whiting Toller. Tell us about that. Well, um, Whiting, uh, who is an artist, uh, when I met him when I was starting the company, you always like to get drawings of what you're going to build. And uh, we wanted the, what you call the beak hull out there because the way it went forward and, and turned out gave us aerodynamic lift to lift us up out of the water, reducing the hydrodynamic drag on boats. So that the, it was there for looks, number one, to identify the boat, but more importantly, it was put there for performance, particularly when you were in the sea going through four, five, six, eight foot waves, uh, that bow stuck out there and flared. If it started into a wave, it would lift it back up instead of letting it keep going down, down, down. So it was kind of an interesting uh, uh, lucky find that Whiting was around, drew this hull. You knew that it would perform in a certain way, but in fact, it performed better than you expected. 
Uh, it, it, it performed as good as anything in the world. And, and also, I'd like to clear up the fact that, that actually, before it was all over, we were selling boats to fishermen. And, uh, and, and when we did 80 million in 2006, uh, six, 50 million of that was the fishing boats. The other 30 million was the high performance sports boats. And, 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 a, and I had a yacht I was building, it was about 47 feet long, 48 feet long. And it, uh, it would run uh, 87 mile an hour. It had a, you know, two bedrooms in there. It was a big thing. And, and so we built a lot of boats and they all ran good, and the marketing told everybody about it, and that helped us bring the money in here to pay to all the good people that we had working for us, and I looked at them as all part of my family. Let's uh, talk for a minute something that's very well documented, and that is your racing. In, uh, while you sold $1.1 billion worth of boats over that same period of time, you spent $113 million racing. That's a lot of research and development. <laughs> yes, sir, it was. <laughs> You got to spend a lot of money and you got to know what you're doing or you could spend more than that and not have any results from it. So, But you learn from every race and put those innovations back in yeah. Yeah. to the design of your boat. Nothing beat being in the boat yourself, steering it, and I'm the one that developed them and I developed them from the experience I had in first water skiing about hydrodynamics and then later in running my own boats and then in the boats we built. And uh, you had to apply hydrodynamics, aerodynamics, water conditions, everything you can think of to these boats and, uh, to make them go fast for fishermen who wanted a fast boat to get to where the fish were. And uh, sometimes in these big tournaments on the waterways, uh, there'd be $100,000 in, 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 in prize money. And so these fishermen were serious about winning and they bought our boats so that when you started at say six or seven in the morning, you had to be back at four in the afternoon or five in the afternoon, you could go to, to many different places to try to find where the fish were. We had people in tournaments here in North Carolina that went up to, that by water, ran up to Virginia to the Chesapeake Bay uh, for catching uh, fish up there. So actually in the later years, the bigger part of our business was high performance fishing boats and pleasure boats for fishermen that like to go out and run around. Most, most fishermen like to go fast. Well, uh, that's interesting that you got into all of those different types of boats. And speaking of going fast, you know, you still are a world record holder for um, speed on the Pamlico uh, with a one-way run of 177 miles an hour yes, and sir. a round-trip run of 171 miles an hour. Why can't anybody break that record? <laughs> Well, uh, that's fast. <laughs> one person is a guy that worked for me in the past, Brian Forehand. Uh -huh. uh, after we, uh, after I left, he left and started his own business in Wilmington, and and uh, he uh, got a, a, a boat and modified it, and he actually came up here and right here on the river where I was running my records. He went 180, about two miles an hour. Wow. Well, actually, from the record of 171 not my fastest one-way run of 177. He, he actually beat that about eight or nine miles an hour. And there's a boat up there now that's built to, to do that. And, uh, and, and we can beat that record now, but uh, we just hadn't gotten around to it because there's been a whole lot going on with the uh, COVID and, and just keeping other things in place. So uh, we'll go get the record back. And, uh, and one of the boats very similar to what I've set the record with before will be used with more horsepower than we had before. I had two 1,500 horsepower engines the first time. This time we'll have two 2,000 horsepower engines and a little bit better better boat as far as little details that we've done to it. Your sons are uh, into boat racing also and have done quite well. Yeah. They've, uh, they've taken some instructions from their father. Yeah, they have. <laughs> uh, my youngest son, uh, Reggie Three. Uh, works for a boat, a new boat company that has ju just come to Washington, North Carolina, and lo located out on the edge of the town. I can't think of the name of it, but they put him in an important position there, I guess, to pick up on the things he learned over the years. When he was three years old, he was out riding in the boat with me, and, and he worked for me in the earlier years, and then he uh, started racing boats too. And he learned a lot, and he came back and was uh, working here at the factory for, for a long period of time. So 
he knows a lot about boats and that keeps him busy. People are always looking for him to help him build boats. You know, Wyatt, my other son, was in the boat business for me uh, for about, uh, I guess, five or 10 years. And uh, during that period of time, he was one of my best salesmen, one of the two best ones that I had. And uh, later, when uh, he left the company after I did, he, uh, he's, he's been selling uh, real estate. You know, I think it's interesting, uh, Reggie, people that know you or are close to you say that there's a number of things that they feel have contributed greatly to your success. But first and foremost is your self-sacrifice. You gave it not only your all, it wasn't 110%, it was 150%, but everything in your life has had to do with racing and boats, and there's there's no five o'clock, there's no, you, you, you have made every sacrifice needed to improve your products and everything that you do. You had a saying uh, that you told your employees, there's no room for second place at Fountain Power Boats. That's right, it came from the Vince Lombardi saying that no amount of pain, suffering, self-sacrifice, or dedication is too great a price to pay for the ultimate victory. Because to the victor goes all the spoils and all the glory, and to the losers only go the right to try to dedicate themselves to becoming a winner. Well, you, um, you still have continued to that today. And I think there's something else that um, I haven't heard anybody mention, but a friend of yours told me, he said, uh, you know, the thing you have to also know about Reggie is Reggie never smoked and doesn't drink. Don't smoke, don't drink, never did drugs, never believed in any of that I, stuff. And, is not good for you. Well, I was going to say, in the business you're in, it's pretty hard to, uh, with all the people that you associated with, uh, not to have a casual cocktail or something. You just, you have maintained a huge amount of focus. So let's go to the future. You're um, now not in the fountain powerboat business, but what is, in automobiles, we are seeing a change from gas powered or engines to electric motors. What, what happens when speedboats go to electric motors. It's all torque, right? That's right. And um, I don't know because I haven't run a boat with electric motors in it. But, uh, you know, electricity can play funny tricks on you in the water more than, say, in a car. And so I don't know how electricity is going to work. Maybe boats will be running gasoline engines a lot longer than, than cars will be. So in the speed records that you set, you weren't actually running gasoline, though, were you? Weren't you running uh, a higher grade of alcohol or something in there? Well, some of the boats, we, uh, most of the boats and most of the races, we use gasoline. Sometimes it would be aviation fuel. Yes. But in some cases, I remember one time we had an important race in St. Louis, Missouri, and Johnson and Evan Rude had come up with a real powerful engine, and we had to be sure we won the race. And so they uh, gave me a special fuel for my boat and uh, an engine. And that thing, instead of turning 7,000 to 7,500 RPM at maybe three or 400 horsepower, it was five or 600 horsepower. It's a little V6 outboard uh, burning a, a racing fuel. But the motors wouldn't last long, just a few minutes. And, uh, but if they get you through the race and you were in first place, that's what you were looking for. Wow. And in the... Uh, coming to set a new record on the Pamlico. Tell us again what the engines are going to be on the boat that you're going to be running. There are a couple of, uh, of, of hand-built Chevrolet engines uh, that uh, are supercharged. Well, excuse me, they're, they're, uh, they are supercharged. They're, they're supercharged, and they'll have close to 2,000 horsepower each, whereas the last record we had, we had about 100, 1,500 horsepower engine. Wow. And uh, they're V8 engines, and we run them out the back of the boat and put, hook them up to two stern drives, Merck Cruiser stern drives, and, uh, and that's what pushes the boat along. Well, uh, we're looking forward to that. What, uh, besides setting a new world's record, what, what else do you have on your radar? What's next for Reggie Fountain? Well, right now I spend most of my time trying to uh, make sure that apartments I invested in during my lifetime, most of them back in the 70s, 
when I was still in the insurance business, I invested in apartments. And in Greenville, we own Eastbrook Apartments, 180 units, and Village Green Apartments, which is uh, 100 and uh, I think it's 140 units. And um, I spend my time with that, and I have a little shopping center I bought in Tarboro. Uh, and I keep up with those three things and have an operation in Greenville that runs them. And I stop by there and keep up with what's going on financially. And I visit the apartments. I visit the shopping center, make sure everything's working okay. And that keeps me pretty busy. Well, uh, $1.1 billion in boat sales. Yes, sir. $113 million in racing. Unbelievable numbers of records and race wins. And the people that own your boats are the who's who of the uh, world leaders, uh, celebrities, and business. Um, and what a tremendous asset to Beaufort County and to Washington. And um, is there anything else that you'd like to tell us? Just a remarkable story. Well, thank you very much. I, I can't leave out the fact that I owe a lot to my parents. I had really good parents. <laughs> they worked day and night to try to see that I did the right things. My mother was valedictorian of her high school. She was smart, and she was always on me to try to be as smart as I could be at whatever I did, and so was my father. So I'd have to say that uh, uh, being exceptional as you can be was started with my, my family, my father and my mother. Uh, I had good parents, and I'm forever grateful for that. Well, I, I think that's a, a very, very kind statement and a very true statement. And we appreciate time that you sat here today and, and told us uh, some really interesting things about uh, your journey into the boat business and uh, all the things that you've accomplished. Thanks so much. Well, thank you very much for having me.